You want to learn how to regear a 14 bolt, don't you? Well, luckily I'm here. Ben from JK Gear and Gadgets. Welcome back to another episode. Actually, the most important and longest episode in the JK One Ton Swap video series. In this episode, we are going to take it step by step on how to regear your 14 bolt rear axle. It's going to be fun. It's going to be extremely long. I am sorry for it, but if you follow along, whether you are doing this swap or not, you're going to learn a lot. You're going to see what's involved and it's actually pretty cool. Let's do it. Gears and lockers, one of the most feared parts by many people of this axle build. Luckily, it's not too hard with a little research, a little patience and some practice. You can do this here at home for a lot cheaper than you would do paying a shop to do it. And we're also going to come out with some pretty cool tools if we ever need to do it again in the future. So I'm going to go ahead and say that I am not a professional gear installer. I've barely scratched the surface of setting up differentials and everything. But luckily, starting off with a rear 14 bolt axle, it is the easiest axle to learn how to set up gears at home on your own. So let's take a look real quick. We already have the 14 bolt on the table. It's welded in. We have the Dana 60 welded in. I'm going to have to swap the 14 bolt over to the cart here so we can get it mobile, but we are not to that stage yet. In the second episode of this video series, I talked about how to remove your carrier and ring gear. So if you're, if you haven't seen it yet, go back and watch it. There's a few very important tips and tricks in that video um, that would get you to this point where it's ready to pretty much start working on it. So Let's take a look at what we have here. I went with the Yukon Grizzly Locker. It is an automatic locker. Went with the uh, Yukon Bearing Puller Kit. It's a clamshell kit. Really not too much, it's not really as needed on the rear 14 bolt as much as it is on the front Dana 60. That's kind of optional, but it makes this job a whole lot easier. Went with a set of 538 thick cut gears from Yukon Gear and Axle, once again, and their master install kit. Really wanted to go with Yukon because they are a great name, a great company, and their stuff is just straight up strong. Now, there's a lot of different gear sets out there. I wanted to keep everything the same company because I know it's going to work well together. Yukon Gear and Axle, their master install kit is a lot pricier than other kits, and you'll see that. You'll be like, what's the difference? Simply put, it's just the bearings they use. They use Timken bearings where other some you know some other companies use the Koyo bearings or Koyo, whatever whatever you want to say. The difference between the two is kind of negligible, but honestly, I'm a fan of Timken bearings and I think they're gonna work really good. But that is enough talking of me in selfie mode. Let's go back to what we were talking about. Since I'm using an automatic, the uh, Yukon Grizzly Locker, we are gonna be reusing the factory case or the carrier in the 14 bolt axle meaning we had to go with thick cut gears real quick summary on thick cut gears versus thin cut if we are using the factory 410 and down case which means numerically lower like 355 or 373s or 410s that this carrier is designed for we have to run thick cut gears if we wanted to go with thin cut gears we would have to get a carrier that is designed for 456 and up so for those of you that want to run an, uh, a selectable locker in the rear kind of choose what you want to do if you want to get the uh, the differential or the actual locker that the carrier is for 456 and up meaning 488s 513s 538s you can run a thin cut gear so we got the gears reason I really wanted to go with 538s because we are pushing heavy axles big tires and the Jeeps aren't the most powerful. So 538s, honestly, what I would recommend to everybody doing this swap, possibly 513s um, if you're adding like a turbocharger or supercharger, but 538s can be nice and low, low geared, crawling on the trails will be awesome. Why did I go with the Grizzly Locker? Why not selectable? Well, simply put, this build is supposed to be a budget friendly build and going with an automatic locker really brings that cost down. It's about half the price of a selectable, and it's going to be really, really easy to install. So for those of you with a 2012 and up JK with an automatic transmission, I wouldn't recommend an automatic locker. It does some crazy things on turns with your electronics of going to limp mode. I know a few people said they haven't had any issues with that. But me being a YouTuber making this video, if you have a 2012 and up auto, I'd recommend a selectable like an ARB a Yukon, really any other type of selectable locker on and off, not an auto. 
For everybody else that has a manual or 2010 and under with an auto, you'll be good with this. So that's enough talking. We have this here. Luckily, these first few steps before we actually get ready to install this can be do done right here on the workbench. What we're going to do, I'm going to go set up the GoPro and we're going to dive right on in. Let's do it. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is disassemble our ring gear and carrier. And we are also going to install our Grizzly locker. Now, after we remove these ring gear bolts, we do not want to reuse them. Sadly, Yukon does not include new ones in the kit, in the master install kit. So they are available for purchase online. There's 12 of them. So it kind of sucks. It's a little bit expensive, but we are going to zap each one of these off. They are not reverse thread. They're normal thread. So counterclockwise is going to remove them. With all the ring gear bolts removed, Honestly, you probably could just smack this ring gear off, but I'm gonna use a nice little brass punch um, Just so I don't mess up the ring gear. We might have to put this in the vise, but let's see if we can get it off Wow, that is a soft punch that sucks There we go finally old ring gear can be set to the side. We are not reusing this Definitely not using it now. Now, with the ring gear removed, before we actually open up this case, we are gonna do two little alignment marks, because as you can tell, it comes apart. We just wanna line it right back up to where it was. So we're gonna clean a little portion right here with our brake parts cleaner. And I'm gonna do two little dots. Right there, so we know where to realign it. And now, simply pop that apart and we can now remove all of our spider gears and just like that super easy now with all those removed we are going to spray this down and clean it up with our brake cleaner now that we have the carrier fairly clean, it is time to take a look at our Yukon Grizzly Locker. As you can tell, it is very, very basic. I'm not going to go into the details on how an auto locker works. Yukon has a great video explaining how this disengages throughout turns to avoid your tires chirping and everything. But it is simply going to drop right in. few things to note, do not take this wing nut off and these washers until the carrier is bolted back together. Before we actually drop this in place, it's really important to make sure that the thrust washers on our spider gear, that little shiny, looks like a shim. This is a thrust washer that you know most spider gears use. You wanna make sure those are off. The Grizzly Locker does not use thrust washers. So we're gonna put this in, slides right in there, remove the thrust washer from the top side, save it, and simply line this back up together where we made our two dots which is right there with our carrier lined up back in place we are going to flip this over and next up would be the time to start assembling our ring gear onto this carrier sadly i don't have the new bolts in uh they're coming in the mail they should be here today or tomorrow but we can go ahead and kind of prep this to get the ring gear on. Before we put the ring gear onto this carrier, we kind of want to deburr it. Any spots where the bolts go through, if there's any burrs, go through with a file and lightly file it down to remove those burrs. Once again, we're gonna clean it off really good with our brake cleaner. Now that we have that deburred and cleaned, we're gonna do the same thing on the back of this uh, ring gear. We are gonna clean up any burrs, for example, there's a few little burrs right there. We really want to file all those down nice and smooth and get this clean before we bolt this onto our carrier. It doesn't take too much pressure to get these burrs off. Very important to do this. I know a lot of people don't, but you really want this to be a nice smooth mating surface onto our carrier. Once again, hit it with a brake cleaner. With the ring gear deburred and clean, it is time to go ahead and get this onto the carrier. A real quick easy tip is if this is pretty clean, you can really clean it up 
bring it inside your oven and heat this up to two or 300 degrees, it's gonna slide on a lot easier. However, Cassie would kill me if I heated this up in the oven in our kitchen. So I'm not gonna do that. We are going to go into, try to see if we can get it on here without really needing to heat it up. It's kind of tricky, you gotta line the holes up and get this put on. You do not wanna use your ring gear bolts to try to suck the ring gear onto the carrier. You can use a soft face mallet and hit it on, but really make sure it lines up nice and good. One real quick tip before you put this on to make it a little bit easier is get your punch and do a small little punch hole right on top of where the ring gear bolt is or the, the hole, the threaded part. So when we were lining this up, we can see and we can align it with the holes inside the carrier. It's actually going on pretty easy just by putting some pressure on it. I'm gonna grab a mallet and finish it up. All right, let's check this out. So as you can tell, the ring gear is on the carrier. There are no gaps. You really do not wanna try to squeeze the ring gear to the carrier with the bolts. That is a big no-no. But I don't know if I mentioned it yet, but the there's really no install master install kits out there that include new ring gear bolts. So we had to buy those separately. Sadly, they are not here yet. They are in the mail. Today's Friday, so with my luck, it's gonna come Monday. What I'm gonna do temporarily is reuse the old ring gear bolts just to hold the ring gear in place so it doesn't fall off the carrier. Once the new bolts come in, we're gonna red lock tight them, torque them down to the, you know, the correct pattern and torque spec. But for now, we're just gonna get them started so the ring gear isn't going anywhere. Now with those started, I'm just gonna get them tightened up. I'm not gonna really, really hammer them on, but just get them snug. Now that that's all done, we can go ahead and remove the nuts that we're holding our Grizzly locker together. The little wing nut and the washers inside there and the big long bolt. Let's go ahead and do that. It's gonna be kind of hard to get up in there. Let's see if we can do it with our finger. Yep. Go ahead and throw our gloves back on. Cool. All right guys, well it's time to go ahead and remove the carrier bearings. I will say that I highly recommend doing this before bolting your new ring gear and putting your locker in. I kind of messed up, but that's the point of this video series, so you, can, you guys can learn from my mistakes. Since I'm using the Yukon Gear and Axle bearing remover, this little portion right here is supposed to sit on the inside, but as you can tell, it's, it's hitting the splines on the inside where the axle shafts go, so I'm gonna have to flip around and use it this way. It's a little shallower. Not really designed to work that way, but it will work. So, this kit is a little bit pricey, right around 360 bucks, but it's gonna let us do a lot of other jobs. And the big thing is that we can remove bearings without messing them up. Most bearing pullers are going to distort this bearing and it's going to render it useless. So in the rear axle, it's not as important because we just throw the bearings on, press them in, and we are good to go. There's no shims. Whereas the front axle, there is a chance that we will have to re-shim it, pull the bearing off a few times. And with this kit, we can do that without worrying about messing up our bearings. So what we're going to do is throw this guy right in there. This tool, I'm gonna go ahead and back it out. We are gonna set this on top, make sure our bearing race is on, and we are gonna put this tool all the way down. You wanna make sure this bottom ring is touching the bearing. Now we're gonna grab one of our little clamps. This is gonna go underneath the bearing, and we are gonna tighten this upper ring just until it's snug, right about there. Grab our second ring and do the same thing under the bearing, slide it on, get our retainer, put it over it, and tighten it down hand tight. Once this is all set up, this is going to push into the carrier and pull that bearing off. You're going to need an inch and a half socket and hammer down. And just like that, our bearing is removed nice and safely. And voila, our bearing is removed without any damage. 
to the bearing. That's awesome. Perfect timing. UPS guy just dropped off our new ring gear bolt. So before we go and press the carrier bearings on, I went ahead and put the uh, carrier nice and tight in the vise. Be careful where you uh, actually, you know, clamp down on it. You don't want to damage, you know, the surface of where our carrier bearings are going to go. I just put it underneath on the actual carrier. Now let's go ahead and remove these and get started. Before we remove these last two, make sure that the ring gear isn't just going to drop down and fall on the vise. All right, so these ring gear bolts use a 5 8 socket, and we are going to torque them down to 120 foot pounds. Make, make sure you have a torque wrench and make sure your vise is strong enough to hold this. So, before we actually go ahead and start these bolts, we're going to want to use red Loctite. The master install kit included this little tube. Hopefully, it'll be enough for all these bolts, but we will see. Definitely use a generous amount and you want to use red Loctite. Definitely don't cheap out and go with the blue. And we are simply going to go ahead and get these started. There's, a, there's two different types of ring gear bolts for the 14 bolt and it's going to depend on what case you went with. So like I was talking about earlier, if you had 410 and down or the 456 and up, just make sure you order the correct bolts for your case. Last one and we still have some red Loctite left over. So don't worry about running out. Put a good amount on each bolt, you're not going to run out. Don't go too heavy with it, of course. But now that they are all started, go through and make sure again, you're going to zap them down snug with our impact. And then go back, do a crisscross pattern until they're all sitting at 120 foot-pounds with the torque wrench. All right, now that they're all started, grab our torque wrench. I'm going to start them off at 100 foot pounds and then do another lap up to 120. So I'm going to start on one section and make sure your ring gear and carrier does not fall to the ground off the vise. Looks like the impact got them pretty close. That one's definitely a little looser. You want to go in a crisscross pattern instead of in a circle. So make sure you're alternating sides going back and forth. We're going to bump it up to 120. We are good to go. Now we can press on our carrier bearings. We now have our carrier positioned in the press. I'm using a block of wood because I don't have arbor plates, but this will work for now. Um, I went ahead and oh, phone call. As you can tell, the bearing is on there, nice and even. I went ahead and tapped it with a rubber mallet just to kind of go ahead and start it. We have our bearing driver up here on top. You want to make sure you're using bearing drivers so it's you're not pushing on this outer bearing because that'll just fly out of here. But we have it all positioned. We are going to slowly start pressing this bearing on and make sure it goes on nice and even. All right, right about there, I'm starting to get some pressure. We're gonna release it, and we might have to use one of our old bearings to finish up pressing this in, and I'll show you why. So, since we now have the bearing and the actual uh, carrier flush right now, since this is flush, it's only gonna push the bearing as far as our carrier will allow it. We'll have to use the other bearing on top of this to push this so it seats all the way down. So what we're doing here is using our old carrier bearing, put it upside down, and this should do the trick. Just like that. All right, let's see if this works. Beautiful. All right, for the other carrier bearing, we have to get an even smaller bearing driver that's gonna sit on the bottom here. That is so we are pressing onto the actual carrier and not that bearing that we just pressed on. So flip that up, make sure it's situated on the care carrier and not on the bearing. 
really hard to show you guys this step, so you'll just have to trust me. And once again, we are gonna throw our bearing on. I'm not gonna start this one. Get our bearing cap, or bearing driver up there. Position this under the press and press it on. The carrier is now set up with our new carrier bearings, the ring gear, and our Grizzly locker. Everything's good to go. Um, it's actually been a few days since I recorded that last portion, haven't done anything, been really busy, but we're getting back at it. So if you are going to be taking time, you know, days, weeks in between doing stuff, I would definitely recommend wrapping up your old, or I mean, our new ring gear and carrier and all our bearings in plastic. This is the plastic that came with the uh, Yukon ring gear kit and i wrapped it up put gear oil in there just so our bearings stay nice and clean nothing's going to get in there nothing's going to rust there is one thing i want to talk about real quick when i pressed on those bearings that last little bit i used the old bearing trick a lot of people do it that way but one thing i kind of noticed is by doing that the race not the race uh the cage of this bearing is actually barely touching the race of this bearing so what i would recommend um if you're gonna do this is make a cut on the old bearing cage so the only thing we have left is the inside bearing race and use that to press on um, by doing it just with the bearing like this it's possible to damage our new bearing I looked at mine inspected it I didn't have any play no damage so we're good to go there but looking back I would definitely recommend cutting one of all our old bearings so all we have is the inside of the bearing to finish up pressing on our carrier bearings but that is enough talking. Let's focus on the next step where we go and talk about the pinion of the 14 bolt. Let's go do it. All right, it's time to go ahead and disassemble our pinion. This is one of the best things about the 14 bolt. It makes setting up this axle extremely easy. All we have to do is go ahead and zap off our six pinion bolts. Uh, they're 9 16 if I remember correctly. And as you can tell, I already took them off. They're not extremely tight. Before we go ahead and remove this pinion assembly, we want to mark it on the removable section and the housing. So I put three little dots there. Reason being is we have our pinion oil gallery uh, coming up here on the diff and it goes in here and lubricates our bearings. I'm not sure if you can actually mess this up, but it's good to go ahead and mark it. Sure, there is a flat side here and a flat side here to help you reassemble it, but I, I've heard horror stories of somebody messing this up and just toasting their pinion bearing the first like 10 miles they were driving. So go ahead and mark this for realignment. And at this point, we can go ahead and hammer this off. Um, I've already taken mine off uh, to make it easy for this video. You know, tap it in a few spots and then tap it on up. It'll, it'll eventually come. There's nothing holding it in there inside. Um, it's gonna come up and we will find a little shim in here that we want to keep. So let's see if we can get this off. There we go, comes out nice and easily, just like that. And here's the shim I was talking about. There might be five shims, there might be one, might not be any. Go ahead and keep that. We will have to measure that later. But let's go ahead and throw this bad boy in the vise. It is time to go ahead and break our pinion nut free. It's an inch and a half socket, and I would really recommend getting the impact. This one from Harbor Freight, the earthquake, and it works amazing. You can probably just hold the, the pinion or the yoke and bust this off. I'm going to, um, but be careful. Don't break your wrist off. You can always use a big, uh, big pipe wrench to hold the yoke so it stays still, but I usually never have any trouble taking these off just by holding the yoke. So we're gonna go ahead and zap this all the way off. Boom, took it off with no issue. And now, just like that, we are gonna remove, let the washer fall out. And it's time to go ahead and press this out. Let's go ahead and take this over to our press. We have the pinion mocked up here in the press and you're probably wondering what in the world's going on. Well, with my 12 ton hydraulic jack, the base isn't wide enough to fit the actual pinion gear down in. So I had to rise it up some so it can press down and out. If you're gonna do this, I really recommend um, making the risers out of steel because wood likes to crumble a lot. But I put some angle iron on the side of the wood I'm really hoping that's gonna hold it in place. Shouldn't be too much pressure to pop this out, but if it starts caving in the wood, we'll have to make something out of metal to raise it up. But we have it sitting here on the side of the housing, the pinion housing, and we're gonna pop this out, pushing right on the pinion. There we go. 
might have to raise this up more and bottom out the the press that's what i was talking about this gap isn't wide enough for the pinion to keep going down so let's raise this up a little bit there we go she's popping out and she's free take it back to our workbench hot off the press we're gonna go ahead and remove our yoke this is a 410 U joint yoke, which is pretty big. We're gonna be swapping this out for a 1350 later on, so we're not gonna reuse it, but you could if you really wanted to run that size U joint. A little bit overkill in most applications. We're just simply gonna pull this apart, and we will now see our old pinion gear, bearing, and the crush sleeve, crush washer, whatever you wanna call it. Set that to the side. Only thing left in here is our pinion seal, a bearing on the inside and another bearing race right here. We're gonna go ahead and use a seal removal tool and pop this seal off. Don't worry about damaging it because once again, we are gonna be getting a new one. We might have to move this to the vise. pain old pinion seal removed this bearing should pop right out cool and now we're just going to drive these old bearing races out with a brass punch definitely get a longer brass punch than what i used um this is way too short you're gonna want a long one so you can if this was longer, I could probably hit it out in like four or five hits, but this is just so short. Kept hitting my knuckle. So we're gonna flip this around and do the exact same thing on the other side. Ow. All right, they are both out. And now it is completely empty. We're gonna go ahead and spray this down with the brake cleaner and really clean it up. Now it's time to go ahead and remove our pinion support bearing. We're gonna take our diff cover off. Now's a great time to go ahead and spray inside here with brake cleaner, lint-free rags, really clean it out. Get any old metal shavings, clean up where we welded if you did the 13 bolt diff cover shave. But we are just gonna knock this bearing out from the diff cover through to the pinion. A few good smacks will do. We're gonna grab our new bearing that came in the master install kit, grab the correct size bearing driver, and simply tap it back in. We're gonna flip the housing back over and make sure it's seated fully. Good to go. Now that that's installed, it's time to press on our pinion bearings. Let's do it. So as you can tell, I cleaned up the pinion, put a little bit of grease here on the shaft, and we're gonna have to press this outer pinion bearing down over the shaft. How I'm gonna do that is by putting the pinion down here, and in order to press on the inside of the bearing, we're gonna need some type of pipe to slide over it and press that bearing. Now the Yukon bearing removal tool actually fits perfect. I'm sure that's not what this is designed for, but it's gonna work. If you don't have that tool, go find a, a steel pipe or even a pretty thick aluminum pipe that will be able to press on the inside of the bearing. So we're gonna make sure this is nice and level. We don't have to worry about shims or anything because on the 14 bolt we shim externally, which you'll see later. Let's go ahead and press this on. Smooth as butter. Now that we have our pinion bearing pressed on, we're gonna remove the race and press it into our pinion housing. I'm gonna go ahead and start it off gently with a rubber mallet. Maybe. <laughs> it's always kind of hard to get these things started, right? <clears throat> with 
with the race started in our pinion housing, we're gonna grab our old bearing race. It's gonna sit right on top. We're gonna grab our bearing driver, and that's how we're gonna press this bearing race all the way inside the housing. Gonna back it off a little bit to make sure we don't get this second bearing race stuck in there. I think we'll be good. Keep driving it down until it's fully seated. We'll flip it over to inspect the back side, make sure it seats all the way. On this top side bearing, the race sits a lot deeper. So we're gonna grab our new bearing race, slide it in. We're gonna use our old bearing, throw that in there, and then throw our bearing driver on top and press it in. And this bearing is now good to go in the trash. I know at this point you're probably tired of me doing all these small meticulous things, pressing in bearings, blah, blah, blah. But sadly, that's what regearing is. It's a bunch of small steps that come out with a perfect outcome, hopefully. So I'm trying not to, you know, sit there and in this video, I'm not trying to do, I'm not trying to drag it out too long, but I want to hit every important step. There's a lot of videos out there on YouTube about this subject, but I didn't, I don't really think any of them are great. And that's what I want this video to be. I want it to be step by step and be able to help one of you guys. I don't want to sit here and talk too long about how to press in bearings, but if you need to learn how to do that, that's when you would go on another YouTube channel, how to press in bearings. So I'm trying to cover all the subjects, but hit them enough without boring you. So we've done a lot today. I think I'm going to take a break here shortly, but we tore apart our pinion housing today, got our new races in, got the new bearing pressed on the pinion. And the great thing about pressing the races into the pinion housing first is that now we can just slide our pinion with the bearing pressed on there. Right there, we still have to push our other bearing in and of course put our new seal on, our new uh, yoke, 1350 yoke, pinion nut, and of course the biggest thing our crushed sleeve washer. Now this is why I'm taking a break because I want to talk about this tomorrow. You can either use a crushed sleeve, this is what we use to set our pinion preload, or you can go with a crushed sleeve eliminator kit. And we'll talk about that tomorrow. So coming up, crushed sleeve versus crushed sleeve eliminator. It's time to talk about crushed sleeves versus crushed sleeve eliminators. If you're not sure what a crushed sleeve is, it is what we use to determine our pinion bearing preload. This is a crush sleeve and it's pretty much a washer that distorts under pressure. It's gonna slide over our pinion and in between our two bearings. The more this is crushed down, the closer the bearings are giving us a higher pinion preload. If for some reason we crush this down too much, the only way to change that is to unpress our bearing, remove our crush sleeve and start over with another one. Luckily the Yukon Master install kit comes with two in case you mess up. Another great option is a crush sleeve eliminator. This is an added expense, it's like 50 bucks, but honestly, I think in the long run of having this actual, it makes it easier. It is gonna require us to put this on and adjust our pinion preload using shims. So instead of crushing a crush sleeve and making it smaller, we are gonna adjust this using shims to achieve our bearing preload. Now, a few things about this is that Whenever we add or subtract shims, we are gonna have to remove our bearing. But the great thing about this is that once it's installed with our pinion preload set, in the future, we can change yokes, we can change our seals without having to worry about going too far on the tightening sequence and crushing and losing our preload in the future. So personally, I wanna go with this option because it, in the long run, it's gonna be a better option. And secondly, there are no good YouTube videos or really anything online about how to set these up. There's tons of info online about crush sleeves and how to you know, properly crush them for your pinion preload. But I thought in this video it'd be good to include this so if you wanna do this route, you can see it in action. There's plenty of other videos on the crush sleeve. So we are gonna go with the crush sleeve eliminator. Let's do it. If you're going just with a crush sleeve, grab the new one, slide it over your pinion, and then proceed to the next step of pressing the bearings on. However, if you're like me and you wanna use a crush sleeve eliminator, I'm gonna go ahead and say I've been doing this for the past hour and a half, two hours, messing with this. I've already done it quite a few times so I can explain it in the best way possible. The easiest way to set this is to get our caliper, measure our old crush sleeve, 
and that's right around 836 thousands or 0.836. So we're gonna write that down. Now we're gonna come over to our new crushed sleeve eliminator, take a measurement on that, and 740 thousands or 0 0.740. We're gonna take those two numbers and subtract our crushed sleeve eliminator, which leaves us with 96 thousandths. So that's the difference between these two. And theoretically, that is what we are gonna be making up the difference with, with these shims. Now there's a, there's a bunch of shims, all different measurements. You're gonna stack them together to be close to that difference in measurement, the 0 0.96, 0 0.096, 96 thousandths. Since this, our old crush sleeve was set up with used bearings, we're gonna have to make up a difference with the new bearings. So what I figured out to be the best is to go a little higher than the 96 thousandths or whatever your beginning measurement was. If your difference was 96 thousandths, set it up to about 98 or 99 thousandths. So it's a little bit bigger and go from there. Now this step, we're gonna put this, our new crush sleeve eliminator on the pinion. We're gonna grab our stack of shims zero it out and I have mine set up right to 98 and a half thousandths which is 0 0.098 I've done this multiple times and this is what the final outcome should be suppose you're not sure yet what you're gonna do is start around that baseline of the difference and go from there to increase our preload we are gonna remove shims and to decrease our pinion preload we are gonna add shims so it's a, it's a back and forth game. It took me about an hour and a half to get the perfect measurement. So right now I'm at right around between 99 thousandths and 98 thousandths. What we're gonna do is grab our pinion housing with our shims installed, slide it over, go grab our bar and press this bearing onto our pinion. So now that we have either our crush sleeve or crush sleeve eliminator on the pinion, we're gonna slide the housing on with our outer bearing sitting on the pinion. Now we are gonna press this all together. And we have to use a pipe to fit the diameter of this bearing race. Once again, our Yukon gear and axle bearing puller is actually the perfect size. So we're gonna set this down here and press this bearing together into the housing. If you're using the traditional crush washer, once this bearing seats, it's a good idea to go ahead and crush that crush washer just a little bit with some pressure. That way you're not battling it when it's on the bench. You just don't wanna crush it too far. All right, now with that bearing seated, we're gonna bring this back over to our workbench. We're gonna go ahead and put our pinion housing in the vise, nice and secure. We are not gonna install our pinion seal yet. However, if you are using a normal crush sleeve, you would go ahead and install your pinion seal. The reason we're not going to install our pinion seal with a crush sleeve eliminator is due to the fact that if these shims aren't right and we need to adjust them, you don't want to keep ruining pinion seals popping this off. So we're going to wait until we know our measurements are correct before installing the pinion seal. We're going to grab our new 1350 yoke, install it, I mean whatever yoke you want, install it. We're going to grab our pinion nut washer, put a little bit of gear oil on there slide it on grab our old pinion nut if you're doing the crushed sleeve you want to use your new pinion nut but since we're going to be taking this on and off multiple times possibly we want to reuse our old pinion nut until we know we have the correct shim thickness get it tight and then we're going to grab i'm going to have to move the gopro back a little bit we're going to have to tighten down this pinion nut and to do that we have to hold it with a big, big pipe wrench and tighten down this pinion nut. All right, that's pretty tight. Now I can go ahead and feel that definitely feels like a good amount of resistance, not too much, not too little. But to check our actual bearing preload, we are gonna use an inch pound dial indicator, put our socket on, and measure the resistance of what it takes for this pinion to continuously turn. So, like I said already, I've done this multiple times. And the first time my preload was way too light, so what we had to do was undo the nut, pop the yoke off, 
take this back to the press, press the pinion out like we did in the very beginning, change the shim thickness, either decrease shims if you want a tighter, if you need your, uh, your pinion preload to be tighter, if you need it to be looser, take away some shims. So it's really not that hard, it is just very time consuming. But let's check out what we got here. And this is my final reading because it is good and I am tired of popping this apart. We're gonna put this on there and we are gonna record the measurement it takes to turn this pinion, which right now without the seal is about 22. So I know I said earlier the spec was 25 to 35. Actually, I don't know if I said that because I deleted a bunch of stuff, but I looked in the manual and the pinion preload spec for this is anywhere from 20 to 35. And that is with the seal on. With the seal on, we're gonna get a little bit of extra drag anywhere from from two to four inch pounds of extra drag but we're gonna check it one more time and we are still sitting around 22 so that is awesome the great thing about setting up this crush sleeve eliminator is that we can tighten this pinion down we can loosen it up a little bit we don't have to be worried about crushing that crush sleeve even more and ruin our bearing preload so that's awesome we can just swap out our our yoke we can put a new seal in. All we have to do is just tighten down that pinion yoke back up to 150, 200 foot pounds, and we don't have to worry about checking our uh, our pinion preload again. But with that being said, 22, I am good. If it's any less or way too much more, you have to pop it off and re-shim it. And keep doing that until you get an acceptable pinion preload. But we are not done yet. Let me go ahead and pop off this nut yoke and install a new pinion seal and reassemble this. Now that we know our pinion preload is correct, it's time to go ahead and install our new seal. What I like to do is put a little bit of gear oil right on the lip here and just rub it around the seal with our fingers. Go ahead and start it by hand, grab our rubber mallet and tap it into place. We're gonna go ahead and put our new yoke on. Once again, put a little bit of gear oil on our old washer. The kits don't come with new washers, not really sure why. I guess it's an item that doesn't really go bad. At this point, we're gonna grab our new pinion nut. Blech. We're gonna grab our new pinion nut, put a little bit of red Loctite in there. And hammer this bad boy on there. And of course, before we call this good, we are going to check our pinion preload one more time with our new seal on. So I'm sitting right at 28, maybe 29 inch pounds of preload with the spec between 20 and 35. That is great. I don't like to be at the high side, high side of preload because that's an easy way to eat up your bearings. So like I said, it's not the initial torque to get this going. It's the continuous. I really do like how this crest sleeve eliminator, you know, turned out. Sure, it did take a long time, hour and a half to two hours to get all the shims and everything right, but I really wanted to make sure that I was making this video correctly for those of you guys that uh, are planning to go that route. There's not many videos or anything online about it, so it honestly, it wouldn't have took me near as long if I wasn't recording it, but it turned out good. One thing I would recommend is even though we hit the uh, pinion nut with the impact, I'd recommend grabbing a torque wrench and making sure it's at least above 150. I'd go up to anywhere 200, 250 uh, foot pounds of torque to make sure this is not going anywhere. But with that being said, our pinion preload is set. It's time to throw this back on the axle and go from there. So up until this point, everything's pretty straightforward and it, it's pretty similar every setup, every time. Now starting here is when things are gonna start getting tricky. This section is really important to do your homework. Watch more than this video, watch a few videos. I will throw a link in the description to a great forum um, on Pirate 4x4. There's a great thread on setting up this axle and it really explains this part really well. I'm not gonna, I don't want this video to be like two hours long. I know it's already long enough. So I'm just gonna kind of do it. You'll see what I'm doing, I'll talk about it but I would definitely suggest doing your homework, read more about this, especially if this is your first time setting up gears. So the shim that we took off originally, 
we're gonna go ahead and set this back on there. That's our original shim. We're gonna grab our pinion with the proper preload now and line up those holes that we made on the housing. And the reason for that is because this is the little oil gallery. Remember, we wanna line those back up. Pretty simple. Now, that was actually really lucky. A lot of the times this is not just slide in because we have that straddle bearing up in here. So we can take a look and make sure it lined up really good. It actually slid in. Usually you have to tap this thing in. Now that this is in with our original shim, we're gonna put our six bolts back in and tighten those down in a crisscross pattern to 60 foot pounds. We're gonna go ahead and remove our bearing caps, the adjuster locks, and the adjuster nuts. Once again, like I talked about in the sec second episode of this video series, when you remove these bearing caps, make sure you keep them in the correct orientation, left upper and right upper. We wanna keep it just like that. So go ahead and remove all this. It's time to put the ring gear in place. As you can tell right here on the diff cover surface, I actually made two markings, Le uh, loosen up and loosen down. That's because these adjusters, you can either loosen or tighten them. And personally, I can never remember which way they go, but now I know that this left side to loosen it, we rotate it up to tighten it, it's gonna be down. And on the right side to loosen it, we're gonna go down and tighten it, we are gonna raise it. So I'm gonna go ahead and loosen this adjuster sleeve using that mark I made. Let's see, one, two, we're gonna go ahead and do three full turns. So our ring gear should slap right in place, nice and easy. This part can be a little bit tricky. Here we go, a little tap will do it. Before we make any adjustments, we're gonna go ahead and put our carrier bearing caps back on. We don't wanna tighten these down yet, but we just, we just wanna get them there and there nice and snug so there's no chance of this axle flipping over and falling and our ring gear flying out. Like I said, we are not getting these on very tight. At this point, we have a ton of backlash and that's the distance of what the ring gear travels before it contacts the pinion gear. You can hear it, that's a ton. So what we're gonna do is loosen our right side adjustment nut. I'm personally gonna do it one full turn. I am basing that off the markings I made. But at this point, the markings are kind of out the window. The markings were more for the fact if we wanted to go back with the original gears and original diff. But now that we have this side backed off, we are gonna tighten this right side until it pushes our gear set until there's zero backlash, nice and tight. Not tight, but snug up against the pinion. So we still have a while to go tighten this up. And that's handy to have these markings here so we know loosen is up, so tightening it down. We're gonna do that until we cannot move this gear back and forth. We'll go ahead and make sure this right side is still nice and loose. Feels like it is. Still have a little play, we're gonna keep tightening it. That right there feels pretty solid. Just kind of mess around with it. Make sure you're not over tightening it where you're jamming it, but just enough to get it contacting that ring gear all the way. Right there is great. Now that we have this set at zero backlash, it's up against the pinion gear nice and tight. We are gonna back our adjuster sleeve off two slots. So loosening it is up. One, two, we're gonna install our little lock here and we're gonna have to adjust it until it fits in there. Now, with that in there, we are gonna tighten this down, not too tight, probably around 15 to 20 PSI. Wow, PSI, <laughs> foot pounds, which is just a little over hand tight. Now that we have our left sleeve adjusted, it's time to adjust the right one. We're gonna rotate this up, tighten it until it contacts and starts putting some pressure on the carrier. Once it does that, we're gonna back it off just a little bit. So we made contact right there, it's nice and tight. We are going to loosen it now and go back once again 
until it puts pressure on it. Right there. Now, to set our carrier bearing preload, if we're setting this up with used bearings, we're gonna rotate this about two slots. For new bearings, we are gonna rotate this three slots. So right now I'm right there. That's one. Oh, it's getting nice and tight. Might have to get a better screwdriver. Two. We're gonna try to rotate it one more. Three. Nice and tight. Man. You really want to have a lot of carrier preload. And honestly, that is not that much. You got to think your ring gear goes through a lot of pressure whenever the pinion is turning it. So putting a lot of uh, carrier bearing preload is, I mean, that's what we're doing here. It's very simple to set up on this axle. It says it uses the adjustment sleeves and you can just read this step by step on the article I linked to in the video description. Now, once we have this tightened up about three, we're going to go ahead and put our lock and nut back in. Now, from this stage on, if we need to increase or decrease our backlash, we have to move these the exact same amount. So if we need to loosen this two slots, we need to go ahead on the right side and tighten that two slots so we maintain our, bear, our carrier bearing preload while adjusting our backlash. At this point, we would go ahead and check our backlash using a dial indicator with a magnetic base. You can get these on Amazon, like 30 bucks. Don't spend a ton of money on these because, I mean, honestly, we're probably only gonna do this twice. Now, if you're a person that plans on setting up gears a bunch, go ahead and spend the money on a nice one. However, I was about to set it up, and I noticed I've, I'm still at zero backlash. There is no movement at all in here, and I even verified it, zero backlash. We set it up for zero backlash, but you were probably wondering why we loosened that two knots and then retightened that one. Sometimes that will give us a pretty good number on the backlash. It really just depends on how tight we actually got this tightened down when we were moving this closer to the pinion. So let me go ahead and show you real quick how you adjust your backlash. What we're going to do is loosen our carrier bolts, not all the way out, just until they're, you know, kind of loose. I guess they're still snug. And then remove our retaining bolts. And we are going to move these adjusters equally. If we want more backlash, we are going to move the ring gear further from the pinion. So we do that by tightening the right side and loosening the left side simultaneously. They don't have to be done at the same time. You can loosen this side one notch, tighten this one notch. If we need to increase our backlash, meaning, meaning bring the number down so they're tighter together, we're going to tighten the left side and loosen the right side. Now the specs for this, according to Yukon, are six thousandths to ten thousandths on the dial indicator. Bloop. A lot of people online say the sweet spot is between five and eight thousandths. Um, so I'm gonna aim right around seven. That's what I'm hoping for. So let's go ahead, zap these off, and adjust this a little bit further away from the pinion so we can start setting this backlash. So if we are set up too tight, like I already said, we are going to move this ring gear further away because the pinion is on this side. So what we're going to do is loosen our right, our left side. I'm going to do one full slot. Let's see. Right there, and we are going to tighten this right side one slot you can kind of check it a little bit maybe not I'm gonna go ahead and do it one more time we are gonna loosen this one slot and tighten this one slot So I can go ahead and feel, and you can hear it if you listen close, there's a lot more backlash. That's that clicking in there, that's the ring gear and pinion making noise. So we're going to see what that number is real quick, we're going to button this all back together like we did last time, break out the dial indicator and check our reading for our backlash. Now that we know what backlash is and how to adjust it, 
let's talk about how to check it. Like I said, we are gonna need one of these dial indicators. I am very close up to this axle, so hopefully you guys can see what we're doing. The magnetic base, we're gonna turn it on and set it on the diff cover surface over here on the right side. We're gonna loosen up this and move it around. So as you can tell, it's adjustable in and out, all types of different ways. What we're, wanna, what we're gonna wanna do is choose a gear right on the top portion, right about there. Go ahead and compress our caliper or our dial indicator a little bit right on the edge of the tooth. Tighten all this up. Make sure we're not hitting anything. Tighten it up a little bit more. And what we're gonna do, and walk over this side, as you can tell, it's not zeroed out, no big deal. We're gonna loosen this little, uh, we're gonna loosen the top portion of our gauge. We are gonna rotate the pinion up as far as, it'll, as far as it'll go. At that point, we're gonna turn our dial until it's at zero. Tap it, let it settle, and hopefully you can see it on the GoPro. We are set at zero. What we're gonna do now is turn the ring gear down. And that movement right there between zero and we are at five, six, seven thousandths backlash which is within spec. That's actually what I was aiming for. That's awesome. One shot, not bad at all. So hopefully I'm gonna lower this down and show you guys this one more time. So like I said, we are gonna make sure the ring gear is all the way forward. Set our dial to zero. Tap on it a few times to zero it out. Right about a little bit more. And we are gonna rotate the ring gear down and look at that reading. So that is seven thousandths. And we can do that back and forth a couple times to make sure. Like I said, the spec, I'm, I've read a bunch of different things. From Yukon, they say six thousandths to 10 thousandths, which is still, this is still within spec. And some books say anywhere between five thousandths and 12 thousandths. The 14 bolt is definitely a strong axle. It could definitely handle that, but I'm gonna go with what Yukon said, between six and 10, and right at seven, we are good to go. Now we don't wanna just check this in one spot on the ring gear. We wanna back this off, rotate the ring gear halfway around, check it there, rotate it a quarter. So pretty much we're checking at each quarter section to make sure there's no crazy ring gear run out and that our variances are all good. If we're getting crazy different readings within uh, allowable, I'd say one to two thousandths difference max. If you're getting more than that, like we just read seven thousandths here, if we rotate the ring gear, halfway around and our backlash over there is at 12 that's a huge difference something is wrong most likely a bearing isn't seated correctly there's some grime up in there we didn't torque down our bearing caps properly those should be fully torqued 135 foot pounds before checking our backlash so let's rotate the ring gear and check it in at least a minimum of four spots Once again, seven thousandths of an inch of backlash, which is great. We're gonna check it one more time. So for example, right here, we are probably halfway around on the ring gear and I am only reading right around five and a half or six thousandths of an inch of backlash. So there is a slight variance, but honestly, that is not bad at all. That doesn't worry me. If I was reading seven everywhere else, and over here, I was getting closer to four thousandths of an inch, then I would start to be worried. It's time for the most fun part, checking our gear pattern. It's the last step. Either it's gonna be extremely simple and we got it the first try, or we're gonna have to do a bunch of reshimming to get a perfect gear pattern. Now this part is extremely critical. You want to make sure you get it right. So what we're gonna do is grab that little yellow tub of gear marking compound that came in our master install kit. We're gonna put a little bit here we're gonna mix a little bit of gear oil in. Get a nice good amount. Come over to our ring gear. Let me set the GoPro, we don't even need the GoPro. What we're gonna do is paint on both the coast and drive side of the ring gear, just a little bit. So the drive side is the vertical section. If you look at the gears, there's vertical and then there's a slope on the 14 bolt the sloped is the coast side 
and the steep part is the drive side. And that's pretty much standard for rear low pinion axles. Now we're gonna paint about three of these teeth and then do it on the coast side as well. Now that our ring gear is marked, we're gonna make sure our pinion is free. I'm gonna go ahead and just start turning the pinion until we get close. And what we're gonna do is turn the ring gear by putting a, and put a little bit of resistance on the pinion. It's kind of hard, but that's a good way to get a good reading. So, went through it once. I'm gonna go ahead and cycle it all the way around. One more time. Once again, putting some pressure on the pinion. It's a lot easier with two people. And then we're gonna rotate it the other way to check the other side of the gear. Run it all the way through one more time. I don't like going back and forth. I don't know, that's just personal. And with that, we will rotate it up and see what our gear pattern looks like. Man, it's kind of strenuous. So, our coasts, actually that's our drive side. Our drive side actually looks pretty good. It's perfectly centered, which is good. It is a little bit on the high side. I like to see it a little bit down lower, but let's rotate it around and check out the coast side. And even that is pretty good. That's actually perfect. So our coast side is perfect, centered and sideways. That is awesome. Now that we have the gear pattern marked, we can open up our fancy instruction booklet. This instruction booklet's very, very basic, but it's, it's good to read. And that's what I was talking about. Coast side versus drive side. And the next page, we have a bunch of different gear patterns. These are all acceptable gear patterns. These show that the pinion is too close and pinion is too far away. And we adjust this by using shims. Luckily on the 14 bolt, the shims are external, so it's extremely easy. Now right here is a perfect gear pattern centered on both the coast and drive side. In my setup, the drive side is a little bit high. So we flip around and we find that here. Pinion is too far away. The coast side is perfectly centered the drive side is a little bit high, meaning our pinion is too far away. So what we have to do is reduce the shim size that we currently have on there, that factory shim we reinstalled. We're gonna measure that and decrease that shim size just a little bit, reinstall the pinion and check our gear pattern again. So let's flip the axle over and change that shim out. So make sure it's nice and clean, throw the calipers on it. Oh, shoot. And this is, I'm reading 16 thousandths. So I'm gonna try to find a shim that is probably close to 14 or 15 thousandths just because we were so close. Depending on what your, you know, your gear pattern was, if you need to move the pinion further away or closer, adjusted by shims. If you're way off and the chart says you need to you know, your pinion's too close, go ahead and increase the shim stack, not substantially, but probably go up five to eight thousandths, check it, and then make the small fine tune adjustments. So like I said, this is 16 thousandths. I'm gonna grab one a little bit thinner and reinstall it. Found a shim that is two thousandths thinner than our factory shim. We're gonna line it up. Now they are, if you do flip it over, um, sometimes the bolts won't line up, so flip it around. Again, just like before, we are gonna line this up with our markings, blah, 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 and slide it in. Might have to tap it in, who knows. Let's take a look at what we got. Got our drive side over here, and that looks pretty good. 
honestly, I might try to bring it in closer a little more. It's still sitting at the top side of that gear. And on our coast side, we are still looking good. As you can tell, it moved in a little bit. And that's what happens when we're changing this up. Both sides will change. So, gonna have to find a happy medium between them two. Honestly, that's a pretty good gear pattern. I might take away a one, another one thousandths to try to bring that in a little bit deeper. But honestly, I'm really liking how that's looking. And as you guys can tell, it's not that hard. We are getting there. So I'm gonna mess around with this. I might keep this gear pattern, I might add more, but we'll be back in a few minutes. I think I'm gonna go ahead and run this gear pattern. Honestly, looking at it, it's, it's a very good gear pattern. I'm happy with it. I could bring the pinion in a little bit closer, but honestly, the next shim size down is two thousandths smaller than what I'm currently running. And I have a feeling that if I do that, it's gonna change up the coast side pretty well. Um, and honestly, looking at it now, I'm, I'm happy with it. This is very important to make sure you get right. Um, they're not always gonna be perfectly centered and you will see that in the install book with all the different acceptable gear patterns. As long as you get it in the acceptable gear pattern, you're good to go. But what I'd recommend if you are unfamiliar with doing this is take a snapshot of these, of your gear pattern on the drive side and coast side. If hopefully you have a friend that's done this before, or you can post it up on Facebook or Instagram or Jeep club and see if you can get a second opinion. Take this picture of someone like, oh, looks like your opinion's too shallow, blah, blah, blah. Definitely get a second opinion if this is your first time doing it. It's getting late, been out here for a while. I'm gonna go inside, go to bed, and tomorrow we're gonna come out here and kind of wrap up this video. I really wanna stress a few things, talk about what parts we got, the cost, and the overall, you know, how hard was this? It's not that hard, but there's definitely some things to think about. So, I'll see you tomorrow, and we're back. So I actually came out here a few hours ago, getting ready to wrap this video up. And for some reason in my mind, I was like, let's check the pinion seal and make sure it doesn't leak. So I flipped the axle over, filled it up with gear oil. And what do you know? Gear oil is flying out of the pinion seal. Like it wasn't even there. So I took, took the yoke off, took the nut and took the pinion seal out. And I found something very, very interesting. So with, the Yukon replacement 1350 yoke. It came with a special seal in the box. Now, I messed up that seal. I don't know if I included that in the video um, when I was first setting up the crush sleeve eliminator kit. I accidentally put that on. I should have put the seal on, but I removed it, threw it in the trash because our master install kit came with a second seal. So I was thinking, okay, we'll just use that seal. That's this seal right here. So I put the seal on the axle, put the yoke on, tightened it up, Cool, that was good to go, right? Well, when I filled it up with gear oil, what I found out is that this seal with the master install kit, as you can tell, does not fit our Yukon replacement yoke. And the reason behind that is that the master install kit is designed to work with the factory yoke. So, it's a two-piece seal system. There's a seal in here with a little adapter which makes this thicker. So when you put this seal on, it works perfectly fine. However, this one, is not designed for the standard seal. So I'm actually kind of glad that I found that out here in my garage, opposed to somewhere where I had to change the seal because it was leaking, maybe on the trail or on the way home. Doesn't really matter, it's a quick fix, but it would've been very annoying to try to find the correct part number seal for this replacement yoke. That part number is 2286. You can get it at AutoZone, Advance, O'Reilly's, CarQuest, wherever. And this is it, very simple and it fits right on. I couldn't find that part number online anywhere for this replacement yoke. It wasn't on Yukon's site. I actually had to go behind the counter with the guy. I brought the yoke in and we found one that fits. So that is awesome. Now, if you don't really wanna buy this seal, you can buy this standard replacement seal for the 14 bolt and get this little doohickey here too. I don't know what this is called. Um, no idea, but I'm assuming you can buy it somewhere. These seals are like 18 bucks each, and I'm assuming that's probably around 20 bucks too. So I would definitely recommend getting the 2286 as a replacement, opposed to buying two things, which might add up to 40. So short story, use the seal that comes in the box with your replacement yoke, and don't rely on the master install kit seal to work on your replacement yoke. So just wanted to give that out there to you guys in case you eventually run into that issue. But with that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and reassemble our uh, 
our pinion seal, put the yoke on, and this is one of the great, a great time to talk about the crush sleeve eliminator. Stuff like this. If we had the standard crush sleeve, when we were tightening down our pinion nut again, we'd really have to make sure we weren't crushing that crush sleeve anymore and blowing our uh, pinion preload. So with the crush sleeve eliminator, I can just hammer down on that nut and we are not changing our preload. Maybe now you'll see why it's a good idea to go that route. But let's throw this on and then close out the video. Just got the pinion seal in and it's good to go. I have a lot to talk about right here, so I'm not gonna drag it on too long. My main topic that I really wanna talk to you guys about is should you do this yourself? There's a lot of factors that come into play. First off, your mechanical knowledge. Do you know how to press on bearings? Do you know, just, just simple stuff. Honestly, it doesn't take a master mechanic to redo this, especially the 14 bolt. It is a beginner axle to set up. It is the easiest axle to set up due to the adjusters and the external pinion. It's really, really easy to set up and hopefully you saw that. So between this video, step-by-step -step for the most part, online instructions and friends, you should be able to get this. Now, do I recommend that every single one of you go and do this? No, there's nothing wrong with paying a shop even though it does get pricey. So I know a lot of you are thinking about price lists. How much did this cost versus how much would it cost for a shop to do it? So let's take a look at the numbers. Come up here to the camera. First thing we're gonna look at is everything we had to get. Locker, I went, if you're doing this, do not leave it open. You're re-gearing, it's the perfect time to add a locker. You don't wanna do this later. My Grizzly locker, the auto locker was $470. You can bring that cost down with some other different lockers, but honestly, the Grizzly locker is very, very strong. For those of you with the 2012 and up JK, that's an automatic transmission, you might have to go with a selectable locker. Do some more research on that, and if any of you viewers are watching this and you are running that combo, let me know in the comments. So hopefully other people, there might be a workaround, I don't know, I just don't wanna give out bad info. Second up, 538 gears, went with the Yukon gear and axle gear set. $252, it's a great gear set. I love Yukon, they make great stuff. Master install kit, 360. Once again, there are cheaper gears out there, but they do use the Koyo bearings, which are a little less quality than Tempkin. So that's up to you if you wanna go with the cheaper uh, install kit to bring down that price a little bit. A new yoke, 1350 yoke was $115. Honestly, I really do like switching up to a new yoke. It wouldn't be a bad idea to switch to a U-joint style yoke, but I was ordering everything from the same place. They all sold Yukon, so I figured I'd stick with the Yukon 1350 yoke. Crush sleeve eliminator, $55. Hopefully you guys could tell that that was a good purchase. I'd highly recommend that. Now, the rest of this stuff is kind of depending if you have it or even need it. So the Yukon bearing removal tool. $330, definitely pricey, but it made this so much easier. And it's also an item that we could either keep using in the future or resell it to get some of that money back. Shop press, we're gonna need that to press on our bearings. 120 bucks at Harbor Freight does the trick, especially with the 20% off coupon. Get that down to 100 bucks. You might be able to find a friend that has a press that'll let you borrow it for a week or two. So you'd be able to save some money there. Calipers, 15 bucks, no big deal. Dial indicator, 30 bucks on Amazon. And of course, ring gear bolts. I put question mark beside that because I forgot how much I paid for those. They're not that crazy. But what does that put us at if we had to buy all this stuff? 1747 dollars. Luckily, I already had some of these tools. You know, I didn't have to buy the press, didn't have to buy the calipers. Um, and you know, there's quite a few things I didn't have to buy and hopefully some of you are that way. But is it worth it? Yes, and here's why. If we paid a shop to do this, they're still gonna charge us the full price for our gears, our locker, our crush sleeve eliminator, our yoke. They're gonna charge us for that. So we're paying that no matter what, plus labor. Setting up a one ton axle is not the same as you taking a JK Dana 44 and saying, hey, I want this re-geared. You can get those re-geared all day for 800, 900 bucks each axle out the door. One ton axles completely different. Gears are more expensive, the lockers are more expensive, and labor fees can be more expensive. Plus, you're not just gonna take this to anybody's shop. 
Jeep, you can't go to a Jeep dealership to get this done. I wouldn't go to a Chevy dealership to get this done. And I wouldn't go to my normal mechanic. I don't even go to a mechanic anyways, but I wouldn't go to the, you know, my muffler shop down the street to say, hey, can you get this done? You're gonna wanna take it to a specialty off-road shop to have them do it. There's nothing wrong with doing that. And I, if you're uncomfortable with all this, take it there. Don't try to do this if you know that this is something that's way outside your grasp. Definitely don't risk it. But what would I kind of project for a shop to charge to do this? Honestly, I think they would charge seventeen or eighteen hundred dollars, which is about the same as what we paid for all this plus the tools. So doing it ourselves, we can keep all these tools. And in my case, having some of these tools, I definitely made it out a lot cheaper. Now, where can you buy all this stuff? I'm gonna include links in the video description to every single one of these things. So you can reference the part number or you can buy it right there. I'm gonna go ahead and put the Amazon, put the links on Amazon, because Amazon sells most of this stuff and usually it is the cheapest and the price stays kind of consistent. But there's a lot of off-road companies that are vendors for Yukon Gear and Axle and a lot of other different gears and uh, locker manufacturers. So two that I'd like to recommend would be Off-Road Elements and Barnes Four Wheel Drive. They are both vendors for Yukon Gear and Axle. You can get their stuff, all your stuff through them. Great thing about Barnes is the fact that we can get our swap truss kits, our diff covers, our uh, steering, our high steer arms, bunch of stuff through them, plus our Yukon gears. I'm not gonna say they can give you a good discount for ordering all that through them. I don't know, but I'm assuming that if you called them up and said, hey, I want to get the swap truss kits, the diff covers, the steering, the high steer arms, Yukon front and gear or front and rear gears, lockers. They're going to be like, holy crap, that's a good order. And I'm sure they can give you a few discounts across the boards, but I'm not going to speak for them. So all in all, it's up to you if you want to tackle this project. Luckily, it's not too hard. There's a lot of resources online. There's a lot of videos on individual parts. If you need a video on just how to set preload, you can watch a video just set on preload. You can go read forums dated back to 2002 on this subject from people on Pirate 4x4 barking at each other, arguing about something. Those are the good old days. But overall, it's not too bad of a project. I think most people that are playing to this swap can probably do it. And honestly, it only took me a couple days. Not bad at all. I'm going to stop talking. I'm rambling on like always. If you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comment section below. But thanks for watching, guys. <laughs> if you made it this far, I'm sorry for how long this video was. But I just wanted to put a very good video out there that highlighted all the steps of this build. Be sure to give this a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and stay tuned for more videos, hopefully a lot shorter than this. Piece. One more thing, for those of you that plan on installing selectable lockers, don't worry, our next video with the Dana 60 will show you that. I'm going to install an air locker in the front, so those same principles are going to translate to the rear. That's great. Now, what about the other things, such as, what if we don't have adjusters on our axle? Don't worry, the Dana 60 video will cover that too, because it uses shims on the bearings as well as a non-removable pinion, so that's going to suck. Stay tuned for that video. A lot of that is going to translate over to the same as a Dana 44, a Dana 30, Dana 70, Dana 80, Dana 90, 90, 91, Dana 1000, Dana 5026. Not an axle. Definitely probably not the same. But I just want to say for those of you worrying about selectable lockers, drilling the hole in your housing and all that good stuff, that's coming up by this time. One more thing, I can't stop talking, I'm on a roll. If you do this, make sure you do it correctly, very easily. Make sure your pinion preload is within spec. Make sure your backlash is within spec. Make sure you have a good gear pattern. That's all I'm saying. If you get those three things right, your gear setup will be good. If you get to everything and your backlash is messed up, your pinion preload is wrong, stop and start over. Do not keep going with something incorrect. Double check it, triple check it, and you will come out with a good outcome. There's only one good outcome, and that's the right outcome. Luckily, having this out here on our workbench, we don't have to get it back in the Jeep anytime soon, so we can disassemble it all right now and start over and make sure everything's 100% correct. Now I'm out.